Welcome back, folks. Um, it's going to be a while before I can put even one mile on this machine and make all kinds of great content for you guys on how to take care of, service, and enjoy your Honda ADV 160. Um, but I figured in the meantime, it would be a good idea for me to talk about motorbike rider safety. I am the least qualified person to talk about this subject, but I've crashed a few times and I've learned a few lessons. And, uh, I mean, multiple times. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about each time I've crashed a motorbike. And what I learned from that lesson, what I did wrong, I figured this information might help a new rider. Um, so here we go. Why don't we start off with rider safety gear? What should you wear? Now, in the state of New Hampshire, where I live, um, helmets are optional. <laughs> yeah, live free or die. Helmets are optional. Um, highly recommended but not mandated. I have always worn a helmet. I've never ridden a motorbike without one. Bicycles, yes. Motorcycles, no. And I'm going to be completely straight with you guys. If it weren't for uh, helmets, I would not be alive today. Absolutely would not be alive. There's no way. Um, I would have died eight years ago. <clears throat> we'll start off with that. <laughs> um, so, I've been riding motorbikes of uh, various forms. Mopeds, scooters, motorcycles. Well, not, I haven't really ridden many full-size motorcycles. I rode one, a Kawasaki Vulcan. No, 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 no. It was a Kawasaki, was it the Concourse? Or the one, uh, whatever, the the... The Goldwing uh, wannabe. Uh, my dad had one, and he let me ride it once. And I rode his, he had a Sportster 1200. I rode that, too. Um, that was the least enjoyable bike I've ever been on in my life. And I've owned a Chinese scooter, like a 50cc piece of junk, and that was more fun than the Harley. Eh, okay. All right, why don't we start off with, um, yeah, like I said, rider gear, helmets. Wear a helmet. I mean, a DOT-approved helmet. You know, don't go on Alibaba and buy some cheap helmet that says DOT-approved, you know, and uh, and some big sticker on it. No, no, no. Buy a real one. I wear HJC helmets. They're a good value. Um, I had a Shoei that was my dad's old helmet for a while. Um, but I, I've only bought HJCs. I've owned two of them. Three, two or three of them by, by this point. And, um... <clears throat> Yeah, they're a great value for the money, and uh, I like the ones with the integrated visors. I haven't bought one yet for this. Um, I'm waiting until the spring, because I just don't need it. I don't need it today. It's snowing outside. What the fuck am I going to do with a helmet? <laughs> All right. Um, wear gloves. Um, as I, Throughout some of the crashes I've been in, one of the um, most common injuries that I've sustained were to my hands. Um, because I wasn't wearing gloves. They make rider gloves. You don't want to wear, um, you know, mechanics gloves like you buy at, at Lowe's, you know, firm grips. No, you want rider gloves. They actually have special uh, pads on the knuckles and on your palm. That's where you're going to get hurt the most. And one thing I want to point out, it's not if you go down, it's when you go down. You will crash. It's going to happen. Um, it could be just a minor crash where you slide out on the road at low speeds, no injuries, nobody gets hurt, you get back on, you ride away. I've been in a couple of those. And then there's the crashes that you go home in an ambulance in. Um, and there's crashes where you go home in a hearse. Um, and you don't go home, obviously. They don't, they don't pull a hearse in front of your house and wheel you out and leave you. No, no, you, you go to the morgue. Um, those are very real things that really happen. And you've got to keep that in your mind. When you when you decide you're going to ride a, a motorbike, you've got to keep that in the back of your mind that this could be the day. And I don't want to scare people. 
And I just want to um, level your expectations and come to grips with reality. Um, the roads aren't safe anymore. People are more inattentive than they've ever been before. Um, rear end collisions are ridiculously common. Um, I got T-boned by an inattentive driver. Um, we'll talk about that. that. That'll be the last one. We, that'll be the, the finale in the video, that, that accident, which ended, nearly ended my riding uh, career, not career, my, you know what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> so starting off with, um, so gloves, you've got to wear gloves. You will crash and your, and your reflexes will make you, you're going to want to swing your hand out. And what so this scar right here, I have a little scar right on my palm, although it's not as visible as it used to be. Uh, that actually is from a piece of gravel that went into my palm um, in a very minor accident. It happened in rural New Hampshire. We'll talk about that too. Pants. Um, wear jeans at a minimum. At a minimum, wear good quality jeans. Not designer jeans. I wear, I have, since I was a kid, I have always bought the cheapest jeans <laughs> imaginable. I don't wear Levi's. I don't wear, I, I, I grew up, you know, um, wearing the cheapest jeans money could buy. And I still wear them to this day. And I, I'm doing pretty well. And I still wear like $15 jeans. Um, the most I've ever spent on a pair of shoes was $60. And I, I, look, I don't care what I look like. But I will say that even those cheap $15 jeans <laughs> have protected me from massive uh, 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 road rash. I, I, I don't know how, but they have. They've done a good job of it. Um, so wear jeans. I see a lot of motor scooter riders especially um, who are obviously inexperienced they don't understand the dangers they're putting themselves into and they're wearing shorts cargo shorts or just regular um or, and they're wearing tank tops and they got their flip-flops on that's another thing is footwear i i typically wear just work shoes um <laughs> keeping keeping with the theme of wearing cheap clothing i typically wear 30 dollar target uh, work shoes. I've been buying the same pair of shoes for three years and I have crashed with those shoes and they hold up pretty well. Um, but you should be wearing, you know, you really want to wear leather. Ideally you want to wear leather chaps. Um, I know you look kind of foolish on a scooter wearing leather chaps, but when you crash, you'll still have skin and you won't have to, you know, go into the uh, skin graft unit. Um, so it's not about what you look like. It's about how well protected you are. Um, but minimum jeans. Don't wear sweatpants. These, these are sweatpants. Don't wear these. Um, they will tear up and you're going to get road rash like you wouldn't believe. Um, this next one is one that I am guilty of. Um, I have been guilty of uh, quite often. And that is jacketing. You want to wear a, ro a motorcycle jacket one that is designed to take an impact on the road and to protect you uh, from road rash. Imagine road rash. Let me, let me, let me give you a, a good idea as to what that looks like. For this demonstration, uh, this is the road. This is your bike. You're driving along with your little bike. Okay. Well, you saw what the road did to this bike. Now imagine if that was your skin. Hmm. Yeah, imagine. That's why you need to wear at least some kind of protective gear. 
Um, could be leather, ballistic nylon, but if you're a risk taker, at least wear jeans. In a low speed crash, they will give you some protection. Again, I wear the cheapest jeans known to mankind and they actually did protect my um, my skin in a, uh, you know, in a rather serious crash. But the alternative, on the other hand, is to throw caution to the wind and just wear a t-shirt, maybe a Hawaiian shirt if you're feeling uh, festive or, um, or just a tank top, you know, and, um, and good luck to you because skin grass hurt. So we've got most of your body covered at this point, but there's one thing we missed and that is eye protection. Um, in some states, in New Hampshire is one of those states, um, you are required to wear some form of eye protection. I wear prescription glasses and I've never been uh, harassed or pulled over for just wearing those. Um, but I do suggest uh, getting a, a helmet with at least a pull down visor. Um, I have been hit with bees um, in my, just right in my chest. That would have been really bad if I wasn't wearing any eye protection at all and it hit me in the face. The, um, the reason behind that is, well, twofold. Debris does come at you. Um, could be from a tree, could be an acorn, uh, could be an insect, could be a piece of gravel flying off the wheel of, a, of the truck in front of you. Um, but if it hits you in the eye, you will likely... You're, you will divert your attention from what you're doing and you will have to now tend to that, which means you're probably going to crash <laughs> or you'll lose control. Um, so protect your eyes. That is a non-negotiable there. Um, I have ridden in some pretty adverse conditions and the eye protection has definitely come in handy. Windshields on motorcycles, um, I do not, as far as I know, supplant that requirement um, windshields only really deflect wind this windshield here let me put it in its normal position now in this position what it's going to do is it's going to create uh it's going to deflect the wind up and around me in theory i don't think it's tall enough to do it effectively but it's not enough to block debris coming at me to my face um it's, it's actually quite short but even if you have a tall windshield, like my old Honda Helix had, um, it still isn't enough to deflect everything from you. What happens is when you're riding forward, even with a full windshield, it does create kind of a, there's a little bit of turbulence right in front of you. On a scooter, definitely. A motorcycle, maybe not so much. Um, but some of that, some of the debris can get sucked into that vortex. Uh, that has happened to me before. So wear eye protection, like jeans, eye protection, and a really good quality shirt, I guess. Um, but yes, I have crashed wearing a Hawaiian shirt that had motorcycles printed all over it, ironically, and um, it was torn to shreds. So... I did get some pretty bad scratches on my back that time. So now that we've pretty much covered some basics, and again, scooter riders are probably the worst offenders. Well, the ones that you find in college towns, on the beaches, because they're not, they're in it for a good time, and wearing protective gear doesn't always jive well with their good time. So they're the ones that are going to wind up um, in some serious uh, pain if if and when something happens. My first crash occurred when I was about 11 years old, maybe 12, maybe 12. I don't recall whether it was one or the other. Uh, I believe it was my, tw yeah, the summer of my 12th birthday. That's, that's That seems to add up right in my head. For some reason, I think I was 11. Ah, it doesn't matter. I was a, I was a kid, I was a child. And um, my dad had bought me a, um, well, he was in the process of acquiring 
a used Honda dirt bike for me. It was a an XR75 maybe. It was a small displacement. It was a 1985 Honda. It, it was the orange and silver and yellow color scheme. You'll see them all over the place. Well, you used to. It belonged to a neighbor of ours. And my dad was going to, to negotiate buying it for me. And um, so he let me t test it out. And I had never really been on a... Well, I had ridden a moped. Um, but I hadn't ridden a, anything like this. This bike had a three or I think it was a three speed manual transmission with a clutch it was a traditional dirt bike and I was riding in circles on our as we had, we lived in a mobile home park that had a giant field in the front and I was just doing circles and my dad's you know coaching me along you know I was probably doing 10 15 miles an hour maybe he's like okay you know give it a little bit more and shift it up into second and i'm like okay i got it in second gear and i'm all proud and like all right i'm going i'm going i don't think i made it to third and i completely panicked i um i was coming around the bend and going in the straightaway it's like a think of it as like a giant oval that i was kind of riding in and on the end of that oval was a tree line just forest just woods trees and um i <laughs> I I panicked, and I, I, I slowed down a bit, and I could feel the bike, you know, it looked like it was going to stall, so I grabbed a little bit of throttle, and uh, I think I grabbed too much. And, uh, well, I was sent into the woods at an estimated 30 miles per hour, according to my dad, or maybe it was 25, and uh, I was cruising straight into the woods, and uh, I, I panicked, and because... I wasn't used to um, clutching and, you know, throttles and all that. And, and I wasn't used to that kind of power either, you know. I just kind of sailed right in because um, I was grabbing onto the one thing that could have saved me. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I had just loosened up my death grip on the throttle, it would have been okay. Um, but, yeah, I went sailing into the woods um, I was wearing a helmet. I was wearing jeans because I always wore jeans. And um, all I remember from that accident was the helmet being torn off my head. There were some low-hanging branches that I struck. And um, I it was actually the, the underbrush that slowed the bike down. And by that point, I had let go because I was, I was actually pulled. I remember being pulled completely back as the tree was coming towards my head. So I was actually pulled backward. So obviously it let go of the throttle. And um, that was it. The bike actually went, it, it rested between two trees. And um, my injuries were just some hurt feelings and a couple of scratches. I was very fortunate uh, in, that, um, in that accident. It was my first accident, but it wasn't my last so, short story long, um, I didn't end up getting that dirt bike. Um, we didn't own it yet, and I already crashed it, so my dad had to repair it. <laughs> we were friends with the neighbor, so it was no hurt feelings. It wasn't a big deal. He actually sold us a, um, or sold me, well, it was for me, a small um, mini bike. I had a centrifugal clutch single speed two and a half horsepower briggs motor and i actually had a lot of fun on that i think i had it for two or three summers i really thoroughly enjoyed that that mini bike um and uh i you know i, I repaired it i kept it going it was constantly needing repairs it was a 1960s briggs engine that was on that thing and uh you know, wasn't designed for mini bikes. It was the wrong engine, the wrong carburetor, the wrong everything. But you know what? It was a lot of fun. I didn't crash that thing even once. I even did little bunny hops, little jumps off of you know, from little hills and stuff with it. And it wasn't built for that, but I did it. So that was my first accident and uh, the aftermath. I got very lucky. It could have been, well, I could have... The, the couldas are endless. The, what could have happened. Now this next accident occurred 
Um, now there's one that occurred on a bicycle, but I don't think I'm going to include that. It, I ended up going to the hospital, but it was, it was, uh, needing surgery, but it was, it was a bicycle, so it doesn't count. Maybe I'll throw it in at the end. It's an interesting, it's, it's, it's a fun one. Uh, but this next accident occurred, um, this was a near hit, actually. I, it was not an accident, but it could have been. And but there's some there's a there's a couple of lessons involved in this next one. So I um I had back in 20, 2013, 20, no, 2012, I had fully restored a uh, it was my second motor scooter. My first one was a little 50cc Chinese thing. And I only kept that long enough to realize I hated it because it was unreliable. Parts were hard to find. It was a piece of crap. Um, the next one, though, it was a, it was a 1986 Honda Elite 150. And it was my first de reasonably uh, powerful uh, two-wheel bike, um, as opposed to a four-wheel bike. That was a joke. Anyway. So this one, it was a... I, I had completely restored this thing. And I used this to get my motorcycle license. In New Hampshire, you can get a motorcycle license on anything above 49 cc's. And then go down to the Harley shop and buy yourself the biggest bike they sell. Or buy a Hayabusa if you want to. And legally drive it. New Hampshire. I love this state. So I got this Elite 150 fully... I. I went nuts. I spent way too much money on this bike restoring it. But a little a little side note, just as a, a feather in Honda's cap, in uh, 2012 or so, I was able to buy nearly every part you could ever need for a 1986 Honda Elite from a Honda dealership. Every part was in stock. Well, in the warehouse, I could get the parts. They'd have to be shipped in, but the fact that they could still sell me the parts, that, that just speaks volumes about Honda and how much they take care of their customers. I mean, my God. Anyway, so I had actually gotten my license at this point, and um, I probably had about maybe one to one and a half thousand miles behind my belt, under my belt. And um, I was riding home from uh, I think my parents' house or something, I was riding at night, <clears throat> pitch black, and just going down a just a country road to my house. I lived in the middle of a, I lived in the woods, and um, there was a Jeep Cherokee, um, probably five or six car lengths in front of me, and um, I suddenly heard a noise. I don't know what it was, but I heard a noise. And it distracted me. And I turn around to see what that noise was. I didn't know what it was. It was some I forget, was it an animal? Was it mechanical? I don't remember. And I did this, looked down, and I looked forward. And that Jeep, which was like five or six car lengths, well, it was it was a distance from me, suddenly was like two car lengths in front of me. Stopped. I wasn't stopped. No, I was cruising and it was just quick reflexes. I luckily, this could have ended badly. It could have ended one of two ways. I could have struck this vehicle and ended up as a passenger unwittingly, or I could have grabbed too much front or rear brake. If you grab too much front brake, you're on a straight run, you'll probably lose some control of the bike and end up on the ground. If you grab too much rear brake, you will slide out and it's not fun. I grabbed just the right amount of brake on each front and rear and I brought my little bike to a stop. Now this is an Elite 150, so it had drum front and back. So it was a drum brake bike. And um and those don't like to stop. Well, I I don't hate drum brakes. I, this thing has a, a rear drum, and it doesn't bother me one bit because I've only ridden bikes with rear drum brakes, so I 
I know what to expect. But I was still a very inexperienced rider. And the moral of this one is, number one, pay attention. Do not get distracted. Do not look behind you. Use your damn mirrors. Um, that's what they're there for. And don't get distracted. I mean, that is like the number one cause of crashes. That's probably maybe the number two cause. Um, but getting distracted by sounds, by any, you know, unless it's life threatening, just focus on the road ahead because that that could have ended very badly. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm making it humorous, but that that could have been deadly, um, very easily. So. Now, this next one actually happened uh, earlier on. I think, I don't think I had my license yet. I was probably, it was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this was one of my first ever rides on that Elite 150. And this is a common mistake that happens to new riders. According to some people I've talked to, like my uncle um, had mentioned his, his ex-wife um, had done the same thing. And this was another near it was it was it could have been very very bad um but one of the things that new riders tend to do is when they're when they're um when they're going around curves uh they don't they focus on what's immediately in front of them and what you end up doing is you end up under understeering you end up not following that curve so you're looking at like, oh my God, it's a curve. And you're looking at the road right in front of your tire. The suggested way that I think he had he had been instructed, because he actually went to the rider, the rider safety course, which I did not do. I can talk about that later. Um, New Hampshire, love New Hampshire. But you have to look ahead, like straight ahead. Look at the curve. And what ends up happening is it's it's a weird thing. Your body, your mind, and the machine become one. And you are able to navigate that curve without really even thinking about it. It's, it's instinctive for a, for a motorcycle ride. Number one is motorcycles don't steer like cars. On a car, when you steer left, you turn left. On a bike, when you steer right. <laughs> on a car, when you steer right, you turn right. I got those mixed up, but I'm going to cut that out. So in a car, when you steer left, turn the wheel left, you go left. You turn the wheel right, you go right. On a motorbike, it's depending on what speed you're at, depending on what you're doing. Because there is a thing called counter steering. So in some cases, if you want to veer left, you push this way. You push right on the... On the uh, on the handlebars and the bike, it depends on the, it depends on how fast you're going, but it all has to do with geometry and science and physics and something Albert Einstein, whatever. Um, but it actually is a thing. So once you become one with the machine and it takes a few miles for your body and your mind and you start to learn the, the quirks of the, of the bike you're on and, Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And this is why, this is one of the many reasons why there is no replacement for motorcycling. It is its own thing. And once you get a taste for it, it's like a shark getting a taste for blood. Um, you just want more. No matter how many times you crash, you want more. Because it's, 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 it's a totally different experience. So when you're going into a curve... Look into the curve, like look straight ahead. Don't look down. Um, so my first trip out in the in the Elite One Fifty, um, I was on my way to work. That was my first trip uh, after getting it. I was on a learner's permit. It's a legal thing. You go to the DMV in New Hampshire. You go to the DMV. You do the written test, and they give you permission to drive for one month, unlimited miles. Um, but you can only do it once. If you fail the test, if you fail the road test, you're done. If you fail the road test after that month, you're done. Um, you now have to take the uh, the course, 
which costs money, it's hard to get into, it takes time out of your day, it's a whole thing. So I was determined to get as many miles on this bike as I possibly could. And um, I did. So my first trip out, I'm going to work and I'm going around a, a, a pretty decent curve. Now the country, again, I lived in the country, so it was all country back roads. And all of a sudden, I must have been looking down. I look up and I'm going into the ditch. And um, I actually had to, I like, I, like, I caught myself. I knew I screwed up. I knew what I did wrong. I didn't listen to the advice that was given to me. I throttled down, hit the brakes, pulled off the road, collected my thoughts, and then continued on my journey. Um, but I was pretty close to hitting a bunch of trees, which would have sucked. That was my near miss, my second one, third one. No, whatever. Who's counting? Lesson learned, it never happened again. It never happened again. I put 5,000 miles, if I recall, on that bike that one summer. And, um, in, in, you know, in New Hampshire, it's cold in the spring, it's cold in the fall. So you really only have a, a short riding season, unless you're the kind of person who wears heated jackets and gloves and mittens and all that. Um, that's not me. I typically would ride between, um, around Easter is when I would start going out. Uh, so about March or is it, I think I would say, yeah, late March, early April is when I would start to do my riding. Um, and then. I would pack it in by, um, I'd say, September, mid-September, late September. Um, I think I did venture out a few times around Halloween. But, you know, when the days start getting colder and colder and colder, um, it's and the nights get longer, <laughs> days get shorter, um, it's not as, uh, I, I didn't enjoy it as much. So I was in a... Um, couple of accidents on my Honda Helix. Now my Honda Helix, I'm going it, to, it's a special bike. The Helix is something that it is. And I, I can say this, I, I can say this, um, truthfully, that the Helix is the best motor scooter ever built, period. There isn't a better scooter than the Helix in both comfort, dependability, um, ease of maintenance, they're very easy to repair and maintain. Um, and um, just overall, you just can't kill the damn things. You, you can't kill, a, you cannot kill a Honda Helix. And I'll prove it to you. So, I bought the Helix uh, the summer after I had um, bought the Elite 150. I only owned that Elite for one summer. I, I bought it in November. I sold it in uh, the next... Yeah, but sold it in August. So I got my money's worth. Oh, I didn't get my money's worth, but I definitely got some miles out of it. The so following season, this was definitely 2011. 100%. Summer of 2011, I bought the Helix. Uh, I bought it uh, from a local uh, Honda dealer. I actually bought it from the same dealer I bought this from. And I got it with 12,000 miles on it. Yeah, 12,000. Yeah. I paid 2,000. And, um, probably shouldn't sit on this with that charge cable there. Yeah, probably not a good idea. So I bought it, um, you know, after a lot of hemming and hawing and I'd looked at, it was actually in the dealer for like almost a year. They just had been sitting in their used department forever. And I finally said, you know what? I'm buying it. And, um, I actually paid for the whole thing on my credit card. Got a lot of points for that. Hmm. So, I get it home, and I went right through it. I did every possible service you could think of. All fluids, uh, new tires, new brakes. I mean, it needed a lot of work. It needed the 12,000-mile service. I did a belt on it. My first uh, crash, real crash, was on the Helix when I actually went down after getting my license and I was going once again going to work and I was just minding my own business I was doing the speed limit nothing wrong and a guy in a Subaru wagon just pulls out of nowhere 
and cuts me off. He actually ran me off the road. And um, by the time, like, I, I, I actually handled it pretty well. I, it's like I actually was almost like I, it's almost like I knew it was going to happen before it happened. And I just maintained my composure. I was off the road. Now the Helix has a ten inch front, uh, ten inch rear tire, and a twelve inch front, smaller than this thing. And it has no ground clearance, like a couple inches. <laughs> it's long. So the Helix looks like a snowmobile. It's long and low. So when you take it off-road um, at speed, like you're suddenly just boom. Now you're... It's like when, uh, when, 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 um, when Marty McFly drives the DeLorean into the 1840s, 1880s. Um, suddenly he's going from a paved road to, you know, it was kind of like that. So this Helix, which has very little suspension travel, it was bounding up and it was just like, I mean, it was, I'm, I'm, I'm over exaggerating, but it was just comically ill prepared for that kind of a, of a, of a terrain change. And so was I, I wasn't prepared for that. So I maintained going straight. It was like, I feel like, like mystery science theater in those old movies when they're got the, the spaceship on a string. Well, it was kind of like that. And suddenly I just slid out, like finally just slid out. And that's where I got this scar right here. And I slid out. I didn't have my, I didn't have gloves. I didn't think to wear gloves. The fuck, why do I wear gloves? That was stupid. So I put my hand out. I fall off the bike. The bike slides a little bit in the in the gravel. It's all rutted in gravel. And the guy stops. I get up. I looked around. I looked at my bike that I just bought. <laughs> and it had scuffs everywhere. The whole side was wiped out. Um, it had, I think it had stalled by that point. So it wasn't even running. And I look up at the guy, I get up, I'm looking down, my, I'm wearing jeans, but, you know, they didn't get ruined too bad. I mean, they did, they protected my, my legs from severe damage. And I looked at the guy, and I said, and you might want to tell your kids to get out of the room. I told him, get the fuck out of here, you fucking asshole. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, get in your fucking car. And get the fuck out of here. I was so pissed off. I I was I was more upset than I was hurt physically. Um I was just pissed. Because I knew I knew, you know what? I, I don't want this on my I don't want this crash on my record. Not that I caused it or anything. But I didn't want to deal with the insurance companies. I didn't want to total out the bike. I didn't I, I just was just angry because if I had filed an insurance claim, they would have totaled the bike and now I'd have to find another one. And I was just, I was thinking about that, you know, I was just, and I was mad because the guy was an idiot and he ran, like he, it was broad daylight. He, he should have seen me. I'm in a bright red scooter. How could you not see a bright red scooter? I mean, and it was like nine feet long. <laughs> the Helix is a beast of a scooter. And I was just angry. I was just, I was cussing him out. I said, just, if you know what's good for you, you'll just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Probably not one of my proudest moments. Um, yeah, yeah, not one of my proudest moments. But he left, he left. And he got off with it, scot-free. It's like, how do I prove that he caused, like, I'm just, all these thoughts are going through my head. It's like, now I gotta prove that he did this and, now I got to file an insurance claim. Now I got to have like, you know, not that the accident would be on my record as a, as a violation because it wasn't, but it was just, I just didn't want to deal with the cops. And so I grabbed my cell phone. I called my boss. I said, you know what? I was just in my first motorcycle, my first real motorcycle crash. I'm going home. Have a nice day. And she <laughs> completely understood what I was doing. Okay, fine. Um, Oh, that was so bad. Damage wise to me. Now, the less. All right, so let's talk about injuries. So I was scraped up. 
um, on my forearm. I think I landed on this arm. I hit this hand. 1-0. Oh, I, I cut my finger. So the Helix's handlebars have plastic. They're all encased in plastic. It was designed in the 80s. So give them a little bit of, you know, whatever. All plastic. Well, that plastic is sharp. And I think what happened was I, I, I had rapidly jerked my hand sideways and I actually cut my finger uh I want to say on the uh the brake reservoir plastic that surrounds it it was exposed it wasn't broken or anything but there was a lot of plastic ex like with sharp edges and I cut my finger on that um I was in a lot of just sore from the crash so I went home and I dressed my wounds and just slept, just sleep it off. The damage to the bike was minimal. Um, it really was, surprisingly. The entire left, I think it was the left side that, uh, that went down. It was um, pretty badly scuffed at the bottom. And uh, most of the painted plastics, like the shiny red, that was okay. There was a little scratch at the rear that I later touched up, and it didn't look very good, but I did my best. Um, but it survived. I rode it home. I was still okay to ride home. The bike didn't have bent wheels or anything. Ran fine, no issues. And, uh, yeah, I just replaced a couple of parts, and it looked good as new. And um, I still have that scar to remind me to always wear gloves. That was the lesson there. There wasn't really much I could have done differently to avoid that crash. Um, I mean, it just kind of happened so fast that, um, I mean, I almost, you know, I thinking back, I, I almost believe the guy was trying to kill me <laughs> because he was behind me when he, like, he was behind me, accelerated and ran me off the road. Like, was he trying to kill me? I wonder. Maybe if I had asked him for help, he would have... Maybe he thought I had a gun or something, and he was, like, scared, and he ran off. I, I don't know. Hindsight is what it is. But that wasn't my last crash on the Helix. So, this next one... It's, a, it's kind of a novel. I could write a novel about this one, because it it, it was an all-day affair, pretty much. So... I used to ride that Helix um, everywhere, um, night and day. This story is not about a crash, but it was a very stupid thing I did that I wouldn't do again um, as I'm a little older and a little wiser. I um, was riding with my dad and my uncle, and we were going to a family reunion. So we, I, I lived in, um, I lived in like middle of the southern part of New Hampshire and we rode from southern New Hampshire to Framingham, Massachusetts for a family gathering uh, the three of us uh, my dad had a um, I think he was riding his uh, Kawasaki um, what model was that Venture Maybe Adventure? Vulcan? I don't know. The full dresser thing. Like a like a Goldwing wannabe. Had a cassette stereo and everything built in. He was on that. My uncle was probably on his... Uh, I think he had a um, Kawasaki Vulcan, which he still owns. And, um, and I had my Helix, which could keep up with those guys on the highway, no problem. And uh, so we're riding in. That's a long trip. New Hampshire to Framingham, that's a bit of a haul. And uh, we took the highway the whole way. So the Honda Helix is highway legal. As is this. This is highway legal. It even says it on the title. Um, but the Helix was a 250. It had a top speed, according to Honda, of 72. And that was a speed that it could sa safely sustain long term. However... Verified with GPS, I had mine up to 84. 
uh, we were, I was, I was actually solo this time. I was going down a slight grade and I got it up to 84 miles an hour on 10 inch tires. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, anyway, and those tires aren't rated for that speed, by the way, uh, little side note. So anyway, we were going to Framingham and, um, I decided at the end of that event, I was going, I had a friend who lived in Boston, uh, right in Cambridge. And, um, and I'm like, Hey guys, I'm going to, I'm just going to go solo. I'm going to go visit my, my, my friend in Boston. So I went from Framingham to Boston highway, whole way. No problem. This, the Helix can keep up in traffic. It can, it can really, it, it is a deceptively capable machine. One of the things that you can do on a Helix is open the throttle up completely and just leave it that way for hours until you run out of gas, fill it up, and do it all over again. It is one of, if not the best scooter, I think I said this earlier, it is the best scooter you can buy for any amount of money. Why didn't I buy one? Well, that's a story for another day. But point being, probably around 5 o'clock at night, Everyone's done with their family gathering, and I decided I'm going to go to Boston. So I did. Made it safely. I got lost. I didn't have a GPS. And I'm calling, I'm stopping every freaking intersection, calling my friend, hey, uh, I'm over here. How do I get? <laughs> it was embarrassing. I got so lost. Lost in Boston on a motor scooter. Mm, good times. So I made it to Cambridge, hung out with him and his, bre and his other friends for a little bit started getting dark. I'm like, I really don't want to spend the night. I got things to do tomorrow. I'm going to head home. I'm like, okay, fine. It's pitch black. It's like eight o'clock at night, whatever. I'm going to ride home from Cambridge, Mass to my house in, in uh, central, uh, southern New Hampshire. And I'm going to get lost. And I did several times. And um, actually some kind old lady gave me directions they're really nice in boston you gotta check it out sometime they're real nice people there so she said look for the shreff's building the shreff's candy factory and go here go there i'm like all right fine so i found the, the candy factory it's a, it's a landmark it's now an apartment building but whatever i get on the highway so i'm on interstate 495 or I think I started on 95, and then you go to 495. And, and then at night, here comes the rain. <laughs> here comes the rain. So I'm on 495 on a Honda Helix in the middle of the night in a rainstorm. It was, it didn't get any better. No, it was terrifying. I'm on this freaking bike throttle pinned wide open to keep up with the traffic which wasn't a problem it can do it on 10 inch tires i'm cold i'm soaked the helix windshield only does so much oh my god visibility yeah my glasses were fogging up <laughs> covered in water really questioning my life decisions I don't know how I got home I don't know but I did and I lived to tell about it and I've told this story many times that little helix earned every ounce of respect I had left in my body that night it got me home safely and uh, it's an adventure that I'll never forget. When I have Alzheimer's in a couple years, and I'm drooling out the side of my mouth, I'm going to still think about that night. And how fucking stupid I was. What was I thinking? I should have stayed the night. I had a bed if I wanted it. But I was, I was too proud. I'm going to ride this 250 Honda back to my house on the highway in the rain at night. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I did. 
And uh, <laughs> wasn't wasn't the last incident on the Helix. I owned that bike for f nearly four years. I think I had it three years total. And I put roughly 30,000 miles on that thing. So yeah, things are going to happen. Here's the next story. So I met up with a couple of uh, Helix owners in my area. And we would occasionally go out for rides. There was like three other guys. All of them like much older than me. One guy was retired. The other guy was a little bit younger. And the other one I still I still talk to. He's probably watching this video. How you doing? I won't say your name because you don't want your name on the internet. But KW, this one's for you. No. Um, so I was... Uh, Went with a, a, another person from this group out to um, to uh, Hampton Beach just to cruise Route 1, check it out. It was a nice sunny summer day, Sunday, and not a lot of traffic. That kind of plays into what happens next. On the way home, so I had just done an oil change. I think I did an oil change like a week before this this ride. And I hadn't really ridden the Helix much uh, since that point. And um, so, you know, no, no worries, right? Just change the oil, should be fine, good times. So on the way back, so we were taking uh, the highway. Once again, throttles pinned. He was on, I think he was on his Helix and I was on mine. Throttle was pinned. I'm doing 77, feeling great. And uh, I'm in the fast lane, past a couple of cars, being an idiot. And all of a sudden, I could feel my... I, I, I noticed in my mirror, I saw like cars were pulling over and they were acting all funny around me. I'm like, what's going on? And, uh, and then I looked again and I could see like blue smoke all over the... Like, like, what's going on? Is there a car on fire? Like, oh my, oh my God, I hope they're okay. And then I noticed my my my, uh, my Helix started slowing down. I'm like, oh, that's not good. I'm like, And then I put two and two together. I'm like, oh, that's not good at all. So I'm in the fast lane. I got to get over three lanes. Luckily, I was blowing smoke signals. And people knew to stay the fuck away from me. So I pulled over to the shoulder and I stopped under an overpass. And that was when the engine seized. <laughs> I'm like, shit, now what? Now what do I do? So I'm like contemplating my next move. And I, I wait a few minutes. I, I get off the bike. I check the oil. There is none. There's no drain plug. I think you need that. Um... So I'm like, great, great. I blew up my engine. I, I, that's all I'm thinking. My engine's done. I'm done. Now I got to, it was getting towards the end of the riding season. So I'm thinking, well, maybe this is the time I pull the motor down and just do a full rebuild. I'm, I'm just, you know, whatever. Yeah, life goes on. Maybe I, maybe I sell it for parts. Maybe I buy another bike, whatever. This is all going through my head. So I'm like, you know, I wonder. I mean, I got nothing to lose at this point so I hit the starter it started up I shut it off it actually sounded pretty good there were no funny noises no knocking nothing like that so I'm like okay this might actually be salvageable so I went ahead and um, I called the tow truck I mean what else would you do I, I have progressive insurance thank you Flo with uh, roadside assistance. What are you eating? No, you can't have whatever that is. I don't know what that is, but it looks like steel wool. No, it's just, it's hair. It's your brother's hair. What the fuck is wrong with you? So, I, uh, called the tow truck, or called, uh, the, the roadside assistance, and they said, oh, it'll be three hours. So I'm like, great, great, great. I'm stuck on the side of the highway uh, in a motor scooter um, with no protection of any kind from the elements. And you're going to let me sit here for three hours. Thanks. Thanks a lot. 
so it just at the, at the I happen to look off in the distance and I, and I see my the guy I was riding with I'm like I thought he pulled off the highway to go to his house no he was going to take the next exit so I flagged him down and he came right over the guy's name is Steve and I um he's like what happened I'm like my oil plug fell out and I figured out why that happened when I was changing my oil that weekend, the, the prior weekend, uh, my neighbor uh, had had distracted me. He wanted to talk about whatever, I forget what it was. Maybe he built something, wanted me to see it. I don't know. My neighbor was, um, was talking to me and distracted me as I was putting the oil plug back in. And I completely forgot to torque it down. Whoops. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> Loose oil plugs aren't just for Jiffy Lube. So I, I screwed up. It was my fault. I, I owned it. You know what? Hey, shit happens. Nobody died. So I, um, I explained to, the, to, to my buddy, I said, you know, um, I, I am kind of in a weird pickle because the engine's not seized anymore. Like, it's it soft seized. That's the term. It's soft seized. It didn't hard seize. So there wasn't really catastrophic damage, and it runs. It might burn a little oil now, but it runs. So I said, and I, and I, and I looked on the, um, I think I had a smartphone at that point. So I looked up the local Honda dealer where I bought this, Nolts Honda out of Manchester, if you want to know. And um, I called them up. And I said, are you guys open? It was Sunday. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're open for another hour. I'm like, oh. I said, I need the following parts for a 1998 Honda Helix. And I said, I need an oil plug. I need a crush washer. Do you have these in stock? He says, yes, we do. I'm like, you rock. <laughs> so I sent my buddy to Honda, which wasn't that far away. It's only like one or two towns down the, down the highway. I said, can you do me a huge favor? And I will owe you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Can you go to the Honda dealer and get me these things? I gave him a, oh, I a quart of oil. I needed this and this and this. Okay. He did it. He came back. I filled the engine back up again. Um, torqued the new spark, uh, the new uh, drain plug really well. And I shook his hand. I paid him. You know, I, I owed him some money for the stuff. And I said, thank you very much. And he went home and I fired up my machine and I went home, and for the next 10,000 miles, that engine never had a problem. In fact, it's probably still going right now. It, that, that bike is probably still on the road. Um, I sold it. Uh, that was the last summer I owned it, actually. No, 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 no. It was the next summer I sold it because I put, yeah, because at that point, I had put 20,000 miles on top of the 12 it had, so it had like 30,000 miles, 32,000. And then I put another 10,000 on top of that. There was no real damage to the engine that I could, that I could find. Um, and it seized wide open, just flat out. Um, complete loss of oil, but it persevered. And uh, I know, I know very well that this thing right here is not built as well as that Helix was. I know that for a fact. This thing might survive a low-speed seize, but if I put it through the torture that I put that helix through, there's no way it would come out the other end. I would have to probably completely rebuild this engine, which is doable, and it's not expensive. Not, not really. Not surprisingly inexpensive, actually. I priced a few things out. But if you've got a Honda Helix, um, I will tell you this. Uh, the day you sell it, you will regret it. I regret selling that Helix. I wish I kept it for the long haul. Um, but I moved on. I wanted something more. I wanted more capability. I wanted, I wanted something that I could feel more confident going on much longer trips with. The longest trip I think I ever did with the Helix uh, was the... Um, I think I took it to, I got on, I went on a few trips, um, to Maine, to Vermont, almost brought it to Connecticut once. I didn't quite make it. 
Um, we Scheduling issues, I couldn't do it. But the Helix is a capable machine, and they're hard to kill. Now, this next story um, also took place on the Helix, and it was after the, uh, the engine seized. And uh, it was, I think, that summer. I think it was that very summer. So let's get into it. So um, I decided to go out on a, uh, it was like a Saturday, you know, Saturday afternoon, go on a little, uh, you know, a little venture on the Helix. And um, it's pretty much all I did on weekends. <laughs> so I, um, I went through it. I usually have like two or three different routes that I'll take just to, just to, you know, go on a little, little cruise. So I was in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and um, going, um, heading, was it, I think it was heading north on, uh, on Route 3, is that a Route 3? I think I was on Route 3. And um, no, I was in Nashua, heading into Merrimack, whatever, doesn't matter. I was on Route 3, and <clears throat> I was... Uh, you know, going along with traffic, it wasn't more like maybe 60, 65 miles an hour. It wasn't really high speed. And um, I happened to notice off in the distance that the sky had just turned black. Like, all of a sudden, like, out of nowhere, the sky is black. Like, that color. And I'm like, that's probably not a good thing. Um, <laughs> this is going to be fun. And then shortly after that, I noticed um, I could see stuff kind of flying in the air. And then I felt it. Um, it was the strongest wind I think I'd ever felt in my life. Um, the cars in front of me were starting to slow down and they were doing one of these. Like the, they were being blown all over the road. And and my <laughs> it's a Buick in front of me can't can't stay on the road I, I guess i have a problem don't i so i i'm ducking behind the windshield of the helix and i could feel the but i couldn't go anywhere i i had the throttle pinned and i was doing 30 um it just didn't have it um the clutch was slipping like mad and because that's a, the 250 is a pretty good powerful torquey little motor and it just couldn't the, the wind was too great um, I just, I said, you know what, I, I waved the white flag, I pulled over, and then I kind of contemplated, okay, what am I going to do? Can I seek, sh no, we don't get tornadoes up here, so don't, it wasn't a tornado. It was later I found out it was a supercell, which is, I guess, kind of like a tornado. Um, but I had nowhere to go. I'm on the side of the road, on the highway, like, shit. <laughs> what now? Um, so I looked up ahead and I noticed there, there's a, there's a middle school. It's on the, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it backs up to the highway and there is an ambulance and put like an emergency access road. It's like half a car wide or something. And it's completely closed. It's, it is closed from public access. Like you are not, if you can be arrested on the spot for, for even thinking about using that road. So I did. I, I used that road. I'm like, there is nothing I can do. I am actually in physical danger at this point. I need to get off the highway. I didn't care how. This was my only way out. So I took that little access road. It wasn't chained off that day for some reason. So I, I took the helix through there into the parking lot. There were trees bending. There were like leaves and debris all over the parking lot. Like this is going to be a fun night. And it was. So I got on the road, um, on the, you know, the surface streets or the, the local roads and, you know, going through neighborhoods and stuff. I had mapped out a route in my head that avoids all highway travel and it's all just local roads. And I figured out that if I played my cards right, I could actually hide out, um, where I work in my office which wasn't that far from there. I'm like, if I, if things get really bad, I can just duck out in there for a little bit. So that was my plan. And <clears throat> so I'm driving through neighborhoods to get back to some main roads. 
And I know it's a long story. I apologize, but there's a point to this. So when you're driving through a storm, not only do you get rain, but you get debris. You get leaves, twigs, all these other things that end up all over the roads. Um, which is also why when you mow your lawn, never blow the grass clippings on the road. You can kill a motorcyclist that way. Don't do that. Leaves and grass clippings are two things that turn to ice, figuratively, um, to motorcycles. It's like riding on ice. You, you have no traction, especially when they get wet. Well, that's what happened to me. So I'm doing about maybe 25, 30 miles an hour um, in a neighborhood. And sure enough, I saw some leaves on the ground. The wind was blowing. The rain was it was kind of drizzling a little bit, like sprinkling. Like, that's all it takes. And I, I knew what was going to happen, and I just couldn't stop. I, I, there's no way I could have stopped myself in time. Um, it just it just happened. I, um, I braced myself for impact. And sure enough, the rear slid out. I went down, scuffed up my paint again, broke the stupid boomerang-shaped visor that was mounted on the side, the factory visor that the helixes have, broke another one. I think I went through two, three sets of those. And um, I'm like, shit. <laughs> I didn't really get hurt. Uh, I know I, I hit my, I think I, I got a little bit sore. I hit my back on the ground. And, um, so I was a little sore, but, uh, I wasn't hurt. It wasn't hurt too bad. Scraped up, scuffed up, but nothing too bad. Picked the bike up once again. <laughs> like, okay, you and me, kid, we're going home. I don't want to get too deep into that story because the rest of this is just long and arduous. Um, but it was not an easy ride home. It was very difficult. There were road closures, trees down, power lines down. It was a nightmare. Um, and it spanned several towns all the way into where I lived. And it was so treacherous. Um, it took me, I think that crash, I went down and hit that supercell probably at around 5 or 6, maybe closer to 5 p.m., I didn't get home until 8, 9 o'clock that night. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. It wasn't due to mechanical failure or anything. The bike was solid. It never once gave me any trouble. Um, another feather in the cap for that Helix. It was just a nice little machine. So we're going to kind of skip to the next one. This next accident was my last. I decided I was outgrowing the Helix. Um, so I had put, like I said, it had 42,000 miles on the odometer. 30,000 of that was mine. And it was time. So I thought. I went back to uh, Nults of Manchester. And... I said, I need something bigger. What do you got? So I looked around the showroom. They had the new Honda Forza 300, which was really tempting. My finances at that point weren't great. I mean, I didn't have a lot of extra money. But I could afford something in the $5,000 range. So um, the Forza was like, I think it was 7000 out the door. Like, they were charging a lot for those. Because they only got like one or two a year. And... And those were so expensive that people didn't want them. It was a weird thing. You know? The Forza 300 would have been a perfect upgrade for the Helix. Um, it was actually the successor to the Reflex. Well, in other, other countries, it's called the Reflex, but we won't dive into that too much. So I, um, I looked over, I picked over some of their used bikes, and they had a Honda Silverwing. 2007 Silverwing. It was um, slow miles, 7,000 miles. It was almost, it was nine years old. It had 7,000 miles. And uh, it was in really good shape. It had some scuffs. You can tell it had gone down before. There were scuffs on the left and the right. And on the belt case. So I negotiated with them a little bit. I said, look, 
it needs these these parts should be replaced and i'm not expecting you to do that but you know give me a break um but i said i want i want the bike to pass inspection whatever it needs whatever it needs and you include it in the price that we agreed on and and i'll buy it and they said okay so they did uh they did a new uh, cbt belt uh they did front brakes they did fork seals, and I think they did one of the tires. I think it needed a front tire, or maybe it was a rear tire. It needed one tire, so they did all of that for me. I paid them. I actually, that day, that moment, <laughs> I ordered, went over to the parts counter, and I said, I need, I looked at the parts that were damaged, and I said, I want that, that, and that. And I want it at cost. And they did it. No problem. You just bought the bike, we'll do it. Perfect. All's well. So um, I took the bike home after it was all prepped and ready to go. And I rode it around for about a week. About, uh, I think I put a thousand miles on this thing in a week. And uh, so the, the Silverwing, let's talk about what that is. The Silverwing is a 600cc parallel twin fuel injected, which at the time was very new. It was a new thing fuel injected with a catalytic converter um it was a beast of a scooter um the wheels were about the same size as this actually i think they're pretty much the same size so bigger wheels um can comfortably seat two top speed of around 100 miles per hour now in that week there was one moment where i'm like you know what I have a clean record. I'm going to see what she can do. <laughs> Maybe I can talk my way out of it. I will neither confirm nor deny that I brought it to 95 miles an hour. And it was so stable and smooth. And I was just taken aback by just how capable that this machine was. I'm like, I'm going to have a lot of fun on this. So I backed off to legal speeds. I will neither confirm nor deny any of that. Um, you can't prove anything. Uh, so I was uh, just enjoying the bike for about a week. Went to a friend's going away party. He was moving to California, or no, he was moving to England for the second or third time. <laughs> and um, that following week, I had to go to work. And um, it was... I think it was, I know what day it was. It was August 20, 26th, I think, 2016. Yeah, I think that's about right. It was either the 22nd or the 26th. I think it was the 22nd. I'm not really sure. I'll have to look up my records. I was at work. Went out to grab a coffee. Took the scooter, obviously. On my way back, just as I'm about to pull into the parking lot where I work, some asshole pulled out and T-boned me. He was, he was actually on the side of the road, and he pulled out onto the road and just went like this. As I'm coming this way, he just did one of those. And um, it just happened in the blink of an eye. And he was parked one minute. The next minute, he was, well, I was basically in his grill. Um, I was probably doing 30, you know. And um, it was a freak thing. It was, it was, it just happened so fast. And the next thing I know, I'm airborne. And um, I ended up. I ended up hitting the the uh, I was in the I think it was in the in the shoulder of the road so I, I I don't think I scraped along the pavement so much but I was in the shoulder and um, he had stopped my bike was I looked up and my bike was way over there all smashed to pieces there were bits of plastic all over the road and um, I was like crap. 
this sucks. <laughs> I was in a lot of pain. I looked down. I saw my, my, my foot was flopped over. I'm like, oh, no, nope, I broke my ankle. Broke something. I'm like, oh, this is not good. I, obviously, I can't get up. My phone, I don't know where my phone was. So he came up to me, and thankfully he stopped. He did the right thing. He says, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, calm down. <laughs> you, you just hit me. It's like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm like, you, you, you get your phone, and you call 911. Okay, okay, okay. So we called 911. Then the neighbors start showing up. I've told this story in, in my other video, too, for those of you who know. Now, one of the things that bothers me as a scooter rider is that people call them mopeds. Now, I'm going to go on a tangent here. The legal definition of a moped varies from state to state. But basically what it boils down to is a moped is basically a, um, a, low, uh, it's a motorized bicycle. Okay, That's what it is, a motorized bicycle. And to be a moped... At one point, it had to have pedals, okay? Now, this is the one thing that mopeds cannot do. A moped can never exceed 25 miles per hour. Not in New Hampshire, not in most states. Some don't even require a driver's license. But the, the speed limit should be 20, the, the, there should be, they're supposed to be governed to 25 miles per hour. Um, they don't register as a, as a motorcycle, they register as a moped. They are very limited use. They're almost useless outside of the city. A moped is, for all intents and purposes, garbage. Like, I have no use in my life for a moped. They're slow. They're cheap. And they're a dime, no, they're a, dime a dozen. This is not a moped. Okay? A parallel twin 600cc 100 mile per hour scooter is not a moped. But what did I hear someone say? Oh my God, it's a moped accident. He crashed his moped. Look, there's a moped. I, I get this. I, I, I must, I must get this from like my dad's side of the family. They're kind of hotheads sometimes. And I remember saying, I'm sitting, I'm on the ground, right? My shirt's all torn up. Remember when I said don't wear a Hawaiian shirt on a motorbike? Well, this is why. My shirt's torn up. I'm bleeding. I got scrapes everywhere. My fucking leg is broken. And I, 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 I leaned up. I said, it's not a fucking moped. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <sighs> you know, and, and, and you know what? <laughs> I kind of laugh about that now. It's not a fucking but it's not a moped. It's a scooter. If you want to be technical, it's a motorcycle that's shaped like a scooter. That was a fun time. Anyway, so Carrot Top, I mean, the guy who hit me, he looked like Carrot Top. Um, he, he was crying. And, and you know what? If I were in his shoes, I would be panicking too. I don't, you know, one of the things that I, I want to point out from that crash there's a there are lessons here. The lesson is know your surroundings as a motorcycle rider, but this lesson is more targeted towards motor vehicle drivers, cars and trucks. When you're pulling into a main road, you want to look multiple times. You don't just look once, look once and go. You want to look, look and as you're going, keep keep your head on a swivel. Look back and forth, left and right, because you just don't know. Now, I wasn't breaking any laws, and technically, he actually, he was cited for failure to yield, of all things, but he did get, he, and then they dropped the charges on him, uh, whatever. To this day, I don't hold any animosity towards the guy who hit me. He was found 100% at fault, which is pretty rare. Usually there's a little bit of a split in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the liability. He was found 100% at fault. Um, I don't hold him... I hold him accountable for what he did, or for what happened, but I don't 
I never wished him any ill will. I wasn't mad at him. I'm not mad at him now. And I wasn't mad at him then. He did the right thing. He stayed. If he didn't stay, it would have been a hit and run. But he did the right thing. You know, he, he, he was panicked. And accidents happen. The thing that you've got to realize as a human being, you could be the best driver on planet Earth. You could be more attentive than, than, than whatever. You could, be, you could be the best driver in the world. You could be the best motorcyclist in the world. You could be the best driver in the world and the best motorcyclist in the world, and an accident can still happen. There are so many uh, factors that can contribute to an accident. It could be mechanical failure. It could be weather. It could be, it could be anything. It could be medical. The point I'm trying to make is, unless the guy came out with a chainsaw and was threatening to, to finish me off, that would have been funny. But barring that, I don't hold him. He's a human being, bottom line. Am I going to go friend him on Facebook? Fuck no. But the point is, he did the right thing. He did the responsible thing. And you know what? Shit happens. That accident was eight years ago. And it's something I'll never forget. And it changed the course of my life. Because after that accident, I decided I wasn't going to ride motorbikes anymore. I said, you know what? I swore it off. I'll never do it again. Um, and what really got me was it wasn't my fault, you know, it just happened and it could happen again. It will, it will probably happen again. I ended up, um, needing surgery. Um, it was, a, it was a whole thing. It was legal. There were, there were legal matters to settle. I, um, I had to hire a lawyer because that's what you have to do. Now, this is my, my suggestion to anyone in a motorcycle crash, whether you're at fault or not, um, call a lawyer. Because one of the things you've got to understand about insurance, so insurance is complicated and it's not, they are not out for your benefit, period. Um, if you're involved in a, in a crash and there is somebody else, another party that is 100% at fault and you know it, you've got to defend that position because in, their insurance company is going to try to weasel out of a claim. They, that's what their, their job, by the way, is to not pay claims. So we had a bodily injury that could have been life-threatening. It wasn't. We had a um, destroyed property um, and a lot of bills. Uh, the broken leg in the United States of America, a broken leg uh, cost about $60,000 to, to fix if you don't have insurance. <sighs> the world we live in, God. Um, not to mention my bike that was destroyed. Not to mention pain and suffering. Did I sue? Is the million dollar question. No, I didn't get a million dollars. Yes, I did. I had to. I had to. I didn't want to, but I had to. Because my, in my health insurance company was coming after me. Yeah. Really. They wanted to get me for $20,000. <clears> $20,000. <throat> That's the world we live in. So the lawyers took care of all of that. No, I didn't get some massive settlement and not have to work. No, no. I, I, I got a little bit for my pain and suffering. And they took care of the medical. They took care of the vehicle damage. They took, or they, they, they took care of all of that. Um, plus the legal fees. And it was a whole thing. I had enough money left over after the paid claim uh, for the bike. Um, and some of the pain and suffering to buy 
my Miata. Um, that was my 94 Miata. And yeah, pretty much all the money, because that, yeah, yeah, a lot of that went to the Miata. Um, the Miata was the replacement for the two-wheeled motorized machines that I decided I no longer wanted a part of. And the trauma from that accident is why I took down all of my motorcycle content, my my motor scooter content, if you will. I had a library of videos dealing with all the Honda Helix specific repairs that are required, how to do them start to finish. I did I, I did so much content. I was helping folks from all over the world dealing with their Helix issues because um, I pretty much already did everything you could ever possibly do to a Honda Helix except for rebuild the engine. I even seized it up and lived to tell about it. But the trauma from that accident changed the course of my life. It made me reprioritize things and it got me to thinking about, you know, the future. Because when you're almost killed or when you're in a position where you could have easily been killed, um, it puts things into perspective and it allows you to rethink, to reassess and maybe reprioritize. That's two of the same things reassessing and reprioritizing whatever um and it was because i bought that miata um that well two things happened three things happened number one the miata um turns out storing them outside in a condo parking lot is a bad idea so I thought, you know, it's like, well, I've been in this condo for a while and I've got some equity and I'm doing pretty well now financially. I mean, I've been in the same job at that point for like 12 years. Why don't I just move? <laughs> I need to store the car somewhere and I'm just going to move. The real estate market was doing OK and I'm like, all right, now's the time. So I put the condo up for sale. I sold it and I found a house, this one. I bought this house because of that crash. Um, so I, um, I'm like, all right, now I have a place to store the car. Because I bought this house, I was closer to Amelia. And we didn't have that distance thing anymore. So I invited her over to the house and we talked a little bit. I said, how would you like to live here? She agreed and she moved in. Eight years later, we're engaged. Because of that crash, because of that crash, I bought the Miata. Because I bought the Miata, I had ended up starting a business, servicing Miata stereos. I have now repaired nearly 100 Mazda Miata stereos because I got hit by an idiot on my scooter in 2016. If none of that happened, if that crash never happened, I would still probably be living in the condo in the middle of nowhere. And that would be my life. Because of that crash, I completely reprioritized my entire life. I wouldn't have these three kitties who are destroying my power equipment. Dude, get off that bag. Thank you. It just makes you realize how your life can turn on a dime. And and it did. For the better. I got lucky. If I wasn't wearing a helmet, I would be telling a very different story right now. In fact, it wouldn't be me telling it. It would be my <clears throat> my my survivors, my parents, my sister. My friends. In conclusion, folks, wear a fucking helmet. As an epilogue, um, why did I buy this? Why am I getting myself back on two wheels? Because I truly miss doing it. I, I miss the wind in my face. I miss the two wheeled experience. And I know very possibly. I could have another crash just like I did in 2016. I hope that doesn't happen. But I've been down that road before. Well, more or less on it. 
<laughs> and you know something? You live once. And, you know, you just can't stop living because one thing happened. You can learn from those experiences. But you can't stop living. You, you have to keep going. I'm not selling the Miata, no. Amelia would kill me. She loves that car. She loves riding in it with me. So we're not getting rid of that. This is going to be just an occasional weekend toy. Go out, maybe go visit people. You know, while Amelia's doing her thing, I'm going to do mine. I'll probably commute on this a little bit. This thing does get 130 miles per gallon or some crazy number. So I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to wear a helmet. I'm going to wear gloves. And I'm going to wear my $12 jeans. And I'm going to just enjoy it. That's what I'm going to do. This does have a lot of new safety features that may have actually prevented one of those crashes. It has anti-lock brakes in the front, and it has traction control. <laughs> yeah. So, there's that. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Until then, folks, wear a fucking helmet. <laughs>